Welcome to a special edition of the Fly Army podcast series. Views expressed in this episode may not reflect the official policy or positions of USACE, the Army, or the Department of Defense. The discussion that follows was recorded live on April 14, 2023, at Fort Novacell, Alabama, the home of Army Aviation, and is presented with minimal editing. And now, the Fly Army Podcast. Welcome aviation soldiers past and present to the Fly Army Podcast. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Joe McCarthy, and I'm the USAIS Commander's Initiatives Group Chief at Fort Novacell. This week, we celebrate the birthday and the 40th anniversary of Army Aviation as a branch in the United States Army. Our theme this year is to honor the past and transform for the future, as we recognize the contributions made by aviation soldiers that came before us that made the branch what it is today, and what we are doing to transform Army Aviation to continue to honor the sacred trust we have with the soldier on the ground. Today, as part of the series of events to celebrate four decades as an equal branch of the Combined Arms Team, it's my honor and privilege to host a discussion between two exceptional general officers and Army aviators. General retired Richard Dick Cody, the 31st Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, and the 17th Army Aviation Branch Chief, Major General Michael McCurry. General Retired Cody is an accomplished and highly decorated combat veteran. With over 36 years of service, he has served in six of the Army's 10 combat divisions and has held several senior staff positions. Throughout his distinguished career, General Cody has demonstrated exceptional leadership bravery in some of the most challenging environments, including in Iraq during Operation Desert Storm. A graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point, General Cody is a master Army aviator, rated in 19 helicopters, and has amassed over 5,000 flight hours. He's commanded various units, including the 160th Special Operations Regiment, Director of Flight Concepts, and the Commanding General of the 101st Airborne Division Air Assault. General McCurry, also a highly decorated military officer, has served his country with distinction for over three decades with five combat deployments in support of Operation Desert Storm, Desert Shield, Operations Iraqi Freedom, and Operation New Dawn. He is a master aviator, primarily flying the OH-58 Kiowa Warrior and the AH-64 Apache. Born into a military family, Major General McCurry followed in the footsteps of his father and father-in-law by joining the Army, serving as an aviation officer and scout helicopter pilot. Throughout his career, General McCurry has served in leadership positions from the platoon level to the commanding general and served in senior key staff assignments. He is a quintessential air cavalryman and leader with over 11 years in commander or deputy commander positions. We're honored to have General Cody and General McCurry on the podcast today to share their insights and experience with us. Gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. Good to be here with you, Joe. Joe. Thanks, gentlemen. Hey, I'd like to start today by hearing your thoughts on what the significance of the 40th anniversary of the Army Aviation Branch is to you. And General Cody, since you're a Yankee fan and the former Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, you can go first. Thank you, Joe. Uh, 40 years, it didn't seem that long, but uh, 1983, I remember it very vividly because I was a young captain promotable in the Command General Staff College. I was Branch TC, Transportation Corps, and I was an Aviation Maintenance Officer, which means I wasn't a 15 Bravo, I was a 71 Alpha. And I got a call from Branch and saying, uh, you know, do you want to stay Transportation Corps? or do you want to join this new, yet to be figured out what your career will be, aviation branch? And it was pretty simple for me. Uh, I I said, I'm I'm gonna go aviation. And I'll never forget the guy, I won't say his name, because he advised me three other times, I never took his advice and ended up being the vice chief. Uh, Tells you something about some of the councils we had back then. But I'll never forget, he said, if you're gonna do aviation branch, you've got to get out of maintenance. I said, you're kidding, I love maintenance. 
uh, it was rather interesting. But it was a seminal change in our Army because prior to that, our aviator commission officers were infantry, armor, engineer, artillery, signal corps, transportation corps. And growing up in your basic branch, you had to go to your basic branch course, your advanced course of that branch, a tour in aviation. Then if you wanted to make major, you had to command in your basic branch and then still have, find time by year 12 to meet your aviation gates. And so it was, uh, it was a smart thing by the Army uh, to change so that we had the branch. But also the doctrine uh, did not reside at Fort, uh, back then Fort Rucker. Uh, the doctrine for scout and attack was at uh, the Armor School. Uh, for air assault and air mobile was at Fort Benning. And for all things maintenance, it was at uh, Fort Eustis. And making us a branch uh, was the first step. And then the second step was once uh, became a branch and General McNair and then certainly uh, General Parker uh, during their time frame, we looked at restructuring aviation companies because there weren't a lot of uh, battalion and brigade opportunities the way we were structured because majors commanded what are now battalions. And so when I was a major, I commanded a 36 uh, ship attack helicopter company. They changed it to J series and made those battalions. And that opened up a, a lot of uh, opportunities for the new aviation branch guys, especially guys who jumped in as majors and lieutenant colonels. It opened up command because they weren't gonna get command in their previous branch. And we were losing the first couple of years. We lost a lot of good majors and lieutenant colonels. And so making it a branch really gave us uh, uh, a laser focus on combined arms. We owned the doctrine, uh, the organizational structure, uh, and everything else. It also, at the same time, gave us better PME, professional military education. Uh, over time, uh, for our lieutenants and our captains, but certainly our warrant officers, uh, and everything else. So uh, it's, everybody looks at aviation today and say, geez, I guess it was always this way. No, it wasn't. And this was a drastic change for our Army and uh, one that uh, was really needed, especially coming out of Vietnam. So uh, 40 years went by quick, Mac. Yes, sir, yes. it did. Uh, you know, f 40 years ago, I wasn't quite where General Cody was. Uh, I was in high school, but uh, shortly after that, 1988, uh, commissioned as an infantry officer, as, as you mentioned earlier, and, and uh, was in the National Guard and came on active duty a year and a half later and, and uh, came here to, to what was then Fort Rucker. And, uh, you know, it was great for me because uh, I, as a kid, I went to Fort Rucker Primary School here, um, and, and it was before aviation was a separate branch, uh, but uh, got to see a lot of what aviation meant and what the possibilities in aviation were. But, you know, I think uh, it, we talk about 40 years as a separate branch, but it's really we stand on the shoulders of giants. And, and one of those is, is sitting right next to me here. Uh, but many more all the way back, all the way back to Thaddeus Lowe and the, and the aeronauts and the, in the Union Army, first Union Army Balloon Corps in 1861 through uh, all the developments of aviation, whether it was first heavier than air aircraft and, and the Wright brothers and Lieutenant Selfridge up through the World Wars, really in Korea, starting to see rotary wing and then America's first helicopter war. And that's a good point to say it's the 40th anniversary of the branch, but it's also the 50th anniversary of the end of the Vietnam War. So it was really important to us here at Fort Novacell this week that we recognized our Vietnam veterans in each of these ceremonies. And so for me, truly an honor to be the, the, the 17th uh, appointed branch chief uh, of the aviation branch and to be able to celebrate uh, this week. And, and it started off, you know, you can't screw things up when you have great material. So we, you can't have better material than CW4 Mike, Michael J. Novacell Sr. And, and, you know, here's a, here's an immigrant that, that from a European family, Croatian speakers, uh, didn't speak English till he went to school and then volunteers, you know, months before Pearl Harbor happened, volunteers to serve his nation 
volunteers in three wars, uh, volunteers to be again in Vietnam, come back and be a warrant officer and ends up being awarded the Medal of Honor because of his focus and his skill on his service to his, his fellow soldiers and, and rescuing 29 of them off the field of battle that day. And then you look at uh, Major General Carl McNair. We celebrated on Wednesday and, and memorialized the headquarters in his name. And, you know, he was the branch chief here when we were trying to decide as an army the path forward and was aviation as a separate branch the right thing. And then he kind of helped push that across across the finish line with Secretary Marsh. And then even though he departed uh, what was then Fort Rucker a couple months later, he went to be the TRADOC chief of staff because the harder part then getting aviation declared a separate branch was the implementation and having to take the pieces that General Cody mentioned from the infantry center, from the armor center, from the transportation school and build those into an organization here at the aviation center that could do all of the dot mill PFP things, all those things we need to make ourselves a strong force. Uh, you know, we're getting ready to wrap up tomorrow night with a ball, but probably most striking for me as we talk about aviation as a branch was, you know, yesterday I was at a memorial service at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and nothing drives home the importance of what we do here, whether it's designing structure or whether it's writing procedures or whether it's arming people with knowledge and developing leaders. You know, aviation is, is a tough business. And every time we break friction with the ground, it is a live fire event. And we have to have the right leaders in the right place to take care of America's sons and daughters. So I'm really honored to be a part of the branch on this 40th anniversary. Absolutely, sir. And I know it's not lost on me that we have like three generations of aviators on this podcast. And like you said earlier, sir, we stand on the shoulders of giants and you're both Desert Storm veterans. And I know as as a as a GWAT aviator uh, that really cut his teeth in, in Afghanistan, I was taught to fly by instructor pilots that that cut their teeth in Desert Storm. Uh, so so thank you to that for that. Okay, let's just jump right into the Q&A portion. Uh, we'll start with you, General Cody. Why did you choose to become an Army aviator and remain a senior leader throughout your Army career? Well, I was 17 years old, uh, actually 16 years old, and uh, the Vietnam War was raging. Uh, 67, 68 were some tough times in Vietnam. And it was the first war that was on TV every night on CBS with uh, the different uh, commentators. Uh, and I started seeing these uh, helicopters flying. And then I saw these skinny helicopters flying, shooting rockets. And I said, man, I want to be a Cobra pilot. And luckily enough, I was uh, able to get a, a secure a, a seat at West Point and went there. And my goal, and we didn't have a branch then, right? Today, uh, cadets, when they, before they graduate, get to pick their branch. And they already know before they leave West Point what their branch was. My branch was infantry. But because I tore my knee up uh, two or three times playing basketball out there, uh, they branched me Transportation Corps, uh, and then I was supposed to go back to infantry. Couldn't get to flight school uh, through infantry, but Transportation Corps said, yeah, we'll send you. And so I got to go to uh, flight school, and then... Uh, graduated, went to Korea, went to the maintenance test pilot course, got my COBRA transition finally, we'll go to a cab unit. And next thing I know, I'm about to be a major. Uh, and so it was uh, pretty, you know, I, I never thought of uh, ever getting out. And back then, before the branch, uh, I knew that I was in a niche of aviation as a main, maintenance officer. And you know, the highest I'd ever go was probably Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, I knew I couldn't com compete for a DISCOM because you know, that usually didn't happen. You could compete for an AVIM. Uh, they were pretty big back then. Back then they called them Transportation Aviation Maintenance Companies. And so, and I was brought up by the Vietnam aviators. Uh, I was in, you know, especially in the cab. I mean, these guys were W3, W4s, and they had two or three tours in uh, Vietnam, and they taught me a lot of things. And I, I was very, very happy with being a maintenance officer in, in my, my cab squadron, uh, my attack company. Uh, and then when I got to Command General Staff College, uh, 1983, before we graduated, we became a branch, and I never looked back. 
And, uh, you know, as uh, our commandant has said, you know, we stand on the shoulders of those. I, I stand on the shoulders of all those Vietnam War officers, uh, crusty old fellas uh, that beat it into me about uh, risk and reward, about discipline in the cockpit. Uh, you know, I had W-4s that uh, to this day still call me by sir, even though we're best friends, because they pulled me aside one day and said, don't call me John and I'm not gonna call you Dick, because someday you're gonna tell me to do something. He said, we need to be as professional outside the cockpit as we are inside the cockpit. And those are some of the things that once we became a branch, we were able to inculcate it into our professional military uh, curriculum here that uh, the Commandant oversees. Uh, and so, no, I, I never looked back. Uh, I never thought I'd go as far as I did. Uh, clearly, the Army has a sense of humor. Uh, but it's been, it's been a great ride and more fun for me now to watch uh, guys like the Commandant and General Tom Drew, who was a lieutenant for me, uh, General McConville, uh, as well as all the W-5s that, that are W-5s now that I served when they were W-1s, W-2s. And so uh, that wouldn't happen if we became a branch. The other thing I'll say real quickly is prior to becoming a branch, we had two rifts in the Army coming after Vietnam in 73 and then another rift. And the Aviator captains and majors did not fare well uh, if you're infantry or armor or artillery if they spent a lot of time in the aviation and not in their basic branch. And so we lost a lot of talent there. And I can remember my first two company commanders, uh, one is, was captain and then the other company commander was uh, as a major at an aviation company. And uh, two tours in Vietnam, each one of them, but because they had hit all the gates in infantry or armor, uh, when the rift came, they were gone. And they were some of the best guys I knew. When we became a branch, we fixed all that. Over to you, Mac, what do you think? Yes, sir, completely agree. I think, you know, why did I become an Army aviator? You know, um, I think as I, you know, growing up as a kid uh, with a dad that was in the Army and, and then watching him fly certainly uh, played a part. And, you know, just about every book that I that I read was either about uh, Guadalcanal or D-Day uh, or sports. Uh, and so um, I think both of those played a role. And, and certainly uh, as I got close to getting out of high school, my dad was encouraging me to to consider different opportunities with the military. You know, I was kind of uh, playing sports and having fun with my friends and, and not paying much attention at that time. Uh, but I got ROTC scholarship and, and uh, uh, that I won at, at basic camp in 1986. And, and from then on, I was kind of sold on uh, at least coming into the Army. And, uh, and aviation was the right path, you know, I always idolized it. So came here to, uh, to, to what was then Fort Rucker in 1989 for flight school. And, and the month I graduated from flight school just happened to be when Saddam Hussein in, invaded Kuwait. And so uh, quickly found myself after a, after a short stop at Fort Eustis, Virginia at the, at the Manus test pilot course, uh, found myself there uh, in the 82nd and, uh, and in Desert Storm. And uh, similar to, to General Cody, all of the instructor pilots were, were Vietnam veterans, and, and most of the CW4s in our units at that time were Vietnam veterans, uh, and, and, you know, they taught us a lot of lessons. Uh, there's, a, there's a guy named Chuck Ridenauer that was an old Cobra pilot from Vietnam, and, and uh, Chuck had me under his arm the night before I left to go to Desert Storm and was, was you know, telling me to, to, you know, do what I had to do, but don't be stupid. And, and, uh, and uh, I, I'll never forget that. And so what kept me in really is soldiers. Um, you know, soldiers will give you energy when you have none left to give. And you, and you go out and you speak to young officers and you speak to young aviators and you go out there and, and help the young armament guys load 30 millimeter into an Apache uh, in the cold of night in the dark, uh, and it will it will give you energy and keep you going as a leader. Uh, so that probably kept me in. I always said I was going to stay in and, and until I wasn't having fun, and and, and uh, here I am. So uh, and the last thing I think is is sense of purpose. You know, um, 
a lot of people in our family has served, have served, uh, some have gotten out, some have stayed in, uh, and, and, you know, our, our family back home has some businesses and, and, uh, the sense of purpose for me is what, what keeps it, keeps it going. And I think the, going back to the beginning when I said I was re- all I read was Guadalcanal D-Day and sports stuff, you know, playing sports, uh, you get the same feeling from your team in the army as you do when you're part of a tight knit team working for that championship. And you're just always trying to better yourself and, and achieve a goal. Uh, and I think, you know, how you just like on a football team, as you grow up learning from the seniors when you're a freshman, and then when you're a senior, you leave the, the, the ones that are younger than you on the team behind. And that's kind of your legacy to the team. That's how it is in the army. And, and, you know, at the point I am now, I just want to help everybody that, uh, that, that I'm around, you know, be as good as they can be, take advantage of the endless opportunities in the army and, and let them flourish after, after I'm gone. Sir, I think you're spot on, and uh, I, I like I like to draw both of you highlighted the Warren Officer Corps, and I think one of the things that makes Army Aviation special is our Warren Officer Corps, and obviously Army Aviation has the most Warren Officers in the whole Army, and uh, really for for officers, you know, whether you're a Lieutenant Colonel, Two Star General, former Vice Chief Staff in the Army, we probably wouldn't be sitting here today if a couple uh, or three or four really good highly technical and tactical warrant officers didn't take us under our wing and teach us how to fly and teach us how to be leaders in, the, in Army Aviation. So I appreciate you guys saying that. Okay, on to the next one. Um, General Cody, this one's just for you, since you uh, get the prestigious honor of being the senior aviator in the podcast. What was it like serving in Army Aviation before it became an equal branch in the Army? And I think you touched on it a little bit earlier. Yeah, yeah uh, the companies were big. And they were commanded by majors, uh, battalions, you know, the 229th when I was a major uh, commanding Bravo Company 229th, Blue Max, uh, the battalion had uh, 70 Cobras and something like 120 aircraft. Uh, and as a major commanding back then, you had an ops officer, an ops NCO, and you had one IP and then the rest of the IPs were filtered down in what they called the attack platoons and scout platoons. And so we were pretty big and unwieldy. Uh, and, but in aviation across the board coming out of Vietnam, uh, we had a rash of accidents, I remember. And I can remember several uh, vice chief of staff sense messages on aviation. And I think that's what sparked the drill to take a look at, maybe it needs to be a branch uh, and put uh, the common, put a common out with the full Dotland PF to it. Uh, but you know, back then we had uh, the Cobra, the Huey, the 58, uh, the C model, uh, Chinook, we still had OH6s, uh, the Series 3. And we used to do full up auto rotations to the ground uh, as part of our check rides. Uh, we didn't have the simulators back then. Another reason why we were doing, you know, a lot of our emergency procedures were done uh, with the aircraft because we didn't have this. We, we had the uh, uh, the UH-1 simulator. They had a Cobra simulator, but it was kind of hokey. Uh, so we were, it was pretty risky out there training. As uh, the Commandant said, you know, every time you lifted ground, it was a live fire event. One of the maneuvers we used to do in the Cobras was a high speed, low level auto rotation. Uh, which if you've flown a Cobra, that was pretty exciting. You come down the runway at 50 feet, 120 knots, and chop the throttle. And then you immediately do a cyclic climb, bump, to get to 120 feet, then you nose it over, that gave the rotor, and then you greased it on. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. Uh, So we stopped doing doing that stuff in the 80s. But I will say say that uh, the one really good thing about being in the 70s and the mid 80s, was we still had the crusty warrant officers and the uh, master sergeants and uh, sergeant first class that had transitioned from being spec five, spec sixes. Because remember, Transportation Corps owned the 67 Novembers, uh, 67 Tangos, the Yankees, the Romeos, and all that. 
But even back then, uh, it was more of a technical piece. And then when the Army, we made the company's battalions and stuff, you needed first sergeants and stuff. And so we got away from the Spec 5, Spec 6, Spec 7. Uh, and we started inculcating here at Fort, uh, back then, Fort Rucker, uh, the BNOC and ANOC and the TI school. That to me brought us back and put the discipline and the precision into uh, our operations. And then the, uh, the uh, ATC, which really had no one to be in charge of them, uh, that became much better. Uh, as well as the what we now call 15 pop of flight ops. One thing I will say though back then, we had arms inspections every year. Every year, arms inspections. Uh, quite frankly, we needed it. Uh, because again, our commanders would come out of, I, I can remember my second commander in the CAV squadron, uh, he hadn't flown in six years because he was in his branch right. and then he shows up and so uh, we needed to have arms inspections back then. Uh, but again, I would just say the transition was made a lot easier because we still had the Vietnam guys there uh, and uh, taking care of us. And it did a great thing for our warrant officers because all of a sudden we started getting specialties for our warrant officers, uh, which was very important for them. You know. Not just safety, but LC officers. Uh, you now call them EW officers, master gunners, all that. Uh, so I, you know, it was uh, a, a busy time back then. Uh, huge units, uh, a lot of accidents, unfortunately. Uh, but starting about 82, 83, you could see, the, and when we became branch in 83, you could start seeing it turn uh, and evolving to where we are now in terms of the discipline and the uh, precision and certainly the training. I mean, one thing about the branch that uh, doesn't get a lot of credit for is getting the right simulators. If we weren't a branch, we would have never, I, I, I'm, I was the vice chief staff of the Army. There was no proponent for simulators for, for aviation. Uh, that was done with, uh, you know, McNair, uh, Don Parker, uh, and some of the other commandants. And because they were a branch, they went out there and got them. And uh, and that, now you see what we got over here at the simulator halls. That one place, place twenty one, twenty one, twenty one, twenty one. Sir, sir, yeah, yeah. Warrior, Warrior Hall, Hall. Yeah. Yeah. Warrior, Warrior Hall. Hall. So sorry, sorry for rambling, but no, that's no, great. I, I can bore you all day. No, no. Yeah. General, General Curry always talks Hall. about you know that time period. He he always uh, juxtaposes that time and period with now. And you talk about the largest transformation we've had in over 40 years happening during that time when Army Aviation came to branch. So I really appreciate you talking about prior to the branch and leading up and, and all those changes. You know, as service platoon commander, uh, I was a service platoon commander twice in a CAV squadron and then an attack unit. I had 145 people as a captain. I get to be a platoon leader twice as a captain. Well, sir, I, I'm, I'm not the smartest guy, but it sounds like you commanded two platoons, two companies, and two battalions, once as a major, once as a battalion. So it seems like luck and time were pretty don't, good. Don't, for don't forget my brigade and regiment. <laughs> Fair, sir. Fair, sir. Some, some would like, would like to forget those times. Those times. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great, sir. Um, we'll move on to the next one. Um, so this one's for both of you. Sir, you're, you're back on the hook, General McCurry. As you both reflect on the branch over the past four decades, what's the most notable achievements or successes that you've found in Army Aviation? Well, I think, uh, you know, I... Uh, from the time I first watched TV, you know, first thing I remember watching TV when I was a kid was, was you know, Vietnam on the news at night uh, with Walter Cron Cronkite, and you know, uh, it, it was surreal to me as a kid because you would actually see some of the fighting going on, and then they would put the numbers up every night. Um, but you saw, you know, the ubiquitous UH one everywhere in those in those reels on the on the evening news. Um, and we, we evolved from there. Uh, and as we came in, you mentioned earlier the greatest transformation in the last 40 years back back then. I think a lot uh, leading up to the formation of the branch, you know, post-Vietnam where we had to, you know, 
really uh, stand up the training centers to focus on collective training for, for airland battle, where we uh, invigorated our non-commissioned officer education system to have those professionals that existed down, you know, below the company level to, to, to drive soldiers. We came up with the big five, you know, and so that Huey we were trying to replace and that Cobra we were trying to replace and that, that Loach we were trying to replace. Uh, we, when we came up with the big five, um, and so that was kind of the first cusp of the advancements uh, towards their land battle. And you know, two of those were two of those were the two the two that were the first of the five to get into a into a fight, so to speak, were were the the aircraft uh, in uh, you know Just Cause and and Urgent Fury with the Blackhawks. And so I think those were great advancements. But again, I hearken back to. You know, Generals McNair, Maddox, Parker, Ostovich kind of having to form the branch and pick the pieces out that made it a professional branch, an equal partner in combat arms. And what is it we expected our, our Army aviation officers to know? You know, uh, you've heard me say a lot, Joe, that as the branch chief, you know, when I when I stick my finger and Eric pulls his chest about doctrine and I say, you know, look, your measure of success is when there's an officer that is talking to the co-ops or the foo-ops in a division command post and he's having a conversation about what needs to happen and, and he leaves and they go holy cow that guy's sharp who is that and they go that's our army aviator that's what we want um and i think the other thing this part of professionalizing army aviation you know we're not the air force I love my brothers and sisters in blue, but we're not the Air Force. We're flying soldiers. We expect Army aviators to see, sense, smell, feel the battlefield like a soldier. That's why we take three quarters of our warrant officers from prior service non-commissioned officers. So we have that flavor. Um, What am I most proud about in that time? Um, Clearly, the uh, safety record that we that we did. You know, my father-in-law, when I when I met my wife, here, my father-in-law was working at the safety center for uh, General Kerr, and uh, back then we didn't have flight data recorders in our in our aircraft, and that was his project. He was working on that, and then you know, as we work through things today, when something bad does happen, we are able to recreate and be a learning organization and get better and save soldiers' lives uh, the next time around because of things like that. Um, and we, cer- I'm certainly proud of the way Army Aviation has. Re, has adapted itself over and over. You know, it's not just a pilot and an aircraft. We are a maneuver force that integrates fires, and no matter what the ground force needs us to do, whether it's airland battle, or it's coin, or it's LISCO, we continue to reinvent ourselves due to the flexibility and ingenuity of our, our aviators and leaders. And the testament to that is, you know, the confidence that ground commanders have that to ask for us. When they are in their moment of greatest need, the first people they want is Army Aviation. Sir? I think, I think the Commandant covered, covered it all. <laughs> uh, a, couple, a, couple things. a couple, a couple things. things. We did some smart things. I say we, the Army, made, made some smart decisions. When we brought the Apache on board, we created the 21st uh, Brigade down there. So every battalion went through, Cobra Battalion, turned in their Cobras, went down there and spent 12 to 13 months, transitioned everybody, and graduated as a fully T1 Apache Battalion. Uh, that was just before Desert Shield, Desert Storm. We had, I think, seven or eight Apache battalions in Desert Shield, Desert Storm. All of them had the same standard tax op because it was all there. That's what the branch did. And of course, the 21st cab was an extension of Fort Rucker down there at the thing. And that shows you the power of the branch. Uh, You know, when you talk about, you know, what some of the greatest accomplishments you know, I would say the uh, raid on Audubon to take out uh, Bin Laden. Uh, can't talk much about the technology and stuff like that, but that was 10, 15 years in the making. Uh, the growth of the 160th uh, and what the Night Stalkers do, I was one of the original uh, Little Bird gun pilots back in 80, 1979, 1980, 81 uh, on the ashes of... Uh, 
Desert One. Desert One. Sure. And having a special operations aviation regiment that takes people from uh, conventional army aviation and then the cross back and forth, uh, over, the, over the years, it raised the level of all aviation. You know, the night vision goggles, uh, all the tactics, techniques, and procedures from the 160th have cascaded in. As the branch, you know, 160th became about the same time we had a branch. And so having our own special operations branch, uh, uh, not branch, but unit, and then the cross fertilization of that talent, but more importantly, the, uh, the tactics, techniques, and procedures. And so when we went into uh, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, we had quite a bit of that. Clearly the last 20 years, when you take a look at what our units were doing in Iraq or Afghanistan, when Mac was over there flying and stuff, a lot of the missions they were doing, uh, we wouldn't have been doing had we not paved, paved the way in terms of bringing the tactics, techniques, and procedures, as well as the equipment. Uh, and so I always tell people, the 160th paves the way a little bit, and we gotta stay right there with them and keep, keep stretching our goals. So, and the result was we were able to do the Autobat raid, which I thought uh, was just very, very, uh, I mean, think about what they did, those pilots. And then, of course, we've had some other, you know, great uh, operations, uh, you know, over the years, mostly medevac, uh, quite frankly. Uh, another reason why it's so wonderful to have uh, Mike Novosel's name uh, out here on the post. Uh, but, you know, Aviators do great things in combat, but I also remind people that uh, they're doing great things when we don't have combat. And that is, you know, the medevac missions we, ha we do every day, but more importantly, the training we do with our ground brethren out at NTC and JRTC so that we raise the level of combined arms operations in the ground regime. So that when we do go to the first fight, it's not a pickup game. And because we have a branch, we've got that now. Absolutely, sir. And and I, I like how you, you talk about the the adaptability and the agility of the branch for change. I think it's also when we look at Army aviation uh, as one of the division commanders, uh, two big tools, as General McCurry says, the words axe and hammer. Uh, and we're the axe because we're that agile force. And I'm a second time go in aviation. So I, I like you, sir, I was an infantry officer first and branch transferred. Uh, and when I look back, uh, you know, throughout my career, the biggest achievements I saw is Arm, Army Aviation saved my life and the lives of my soldiers, more importantly, with Apache helicopters or the medevac aircraft that came in with that golden hour response that, that literally saved lives. Uh, so I appreciate that. Okay, on to the next one. From the beginning of your respective careers until today, what has changed in Army Aviation and what stayed the same? Well, I think, uh, you know, uh, we talked, we just talked about, he put something on my mind that, you know, I know he wouldn't mind me uh, uh, quoting him, but, uh, you know, General Townsend, you know, uh, or, uh, and uh, both General Townsend and General Oates uh, talked to me uh, when I was 10th Cab Commander about, you know, uh, this, they kind of led me to this thing that I talk about, about the sacred trust with the soldier on the ground, because they, they both said, you know, we knew on our worst day you were going to come. Uh, and that's what I try to drive home in our aviators now is there's a sacred trust that that soldier on the ground has in us and we have to uphold that commitment. Um, and then, I, you know, I like to build a little bit on what General Cody said, too. You know, one of the things that, that uh, uh, has evolved, I don't know, changed, evolved, but, you know, this not only cross fertilization of talent uh, and paving the way for us, but we are very much partnered with Special Operations Aviation and the conventional force. I always tell the team, you know, the regiment goes how conventional army goes because they have to cultivate their their talent from the conventional force. But we go in the conventional force also how the regiment goes because they're experimenting with techniques, uh, tactics, procedures, you know, they're 
innovating with technology at a, at a faster clip than the conventional course force can. And frequently then we're able to spin those things out into a, a scale that the conventional army requires once it's been proven out. So I think that's that's really something that's been great as we've evolved as a branch. Um, we've taken a lot of, uh, you know, we've taken advantage of a lot of opportunities. We've had a lot of opportunities as aviation because of our agility, our flexibility, you know, our speed um, on the battlefield. Um, so I'd like to focus a little bit on, on a couple things that, um, that I that, that concern me, and, and this isn't necessarily aviation specific, although I see it because our aviators tend to be very connected to their tech. Uh, and I think the digitization in some aspects of our force uh, makes it harder to be more cohesive. I think it separates us. We get under the illusion that we're, we're as cohesive as we once were because we're uh, texting each other, but there's not the same connectivity there in, in the relationship building. And that's very important, I think, in our crews, in our units, and in our partnership with, with our, our brothers and sisters on the ground. Um, and, you know, back to the more positive, I think back to when we when you used to go in a, in a division command post or higher, um, you would see very few aviators, maybe the air officer. And then Today, you walk into any of these BCTs and, you know, the guy that went there to be the aviation officer is serving as the, the, the chief of operations or the chief of plans because, you know, and in my own case, one of my brother brigade commanders, when I was a cab commander, said, hey, your BAO is so good, I want him to be my brigade XO. You know, can aviation support him being my BCT XO? And we did, you know, just to, just to further solidify that connection. And so I think over time, the positive is we have gained the respect of our combat arms peers. And, and because of that, opportunities are greater uh, as you as you move through those formations. Sir? Well, I think what, what, stayed, what stayed the same is our regimen in terms of constantly uh, being examined tested, evaluated. Uh, when I give the division commanders course with the, the Commandant, we remind our, uh, our uh, infantry and armor and combat arms uh, generals that the colonels and captains and majors of your, in your aviation house are the most examined, tested people of, the, of any profession. It's not unusual for them to have four or five check rides in an annual. Uh, and so in their technical and tactical expertise, they are graded constantly. And we've kept that and kept that high bar. You know, we have uh, gates that you have to meet all the time and we haven't fallen off of them. Uh, I think that has helped the branch in terms of the, the quality of the young uh, captains as they develop and then move to major and battalion and stuff. It, it really, and it shows to the other uh, commanders, uh, the brigade, the example that Mac gave about a BCT commander saying, hey, I need this guy to be my XO. Uh, and so we're constantly still learning and, and curious because we know we're gonna get a check ride. And that's what stayed the same. Uh, what has changed? Uh, I worry not so much about the iPhone text messaging and people uh, getting out of their offices. I, I know we can fix that. I worry about uh, screens on in the more complex aircraft. Uh, I worry uh, that our guys and gals are spending too much time heads down in the cockpit. And I try to, every place I go, Commandant, I say, the lower you go, the less you look in the cockpit. You've got to be outside the cockpit. And we always have this three ways of uh, controls. I have the controls, you have the controls, I have the controls. Uh, a lot of these accidents that uh, unfortunately we get to look at, no one's talking about who's, I'm, I'm inside, I'm outside. You don't hear that too much. No, and we've got to bring that back because what's happened is we've, uh, and, and we need the technology for sure. 
Uh, but boy, we need to balance it. And uh, I worry about that. Uh, we've taken great strides with our uh, simulators, but I don't think we've used our simulators enough. I think if we use our simulators more for that, when they get out there, because we're going to be flying low level nap of the earth fast. And when we bring FVL on board, we're going to be flying real fast, but we're still going to be low. Uh, no time to be playing with stuff in the cockpit. Uh, you know, and I doubt if we'll ever get Siri or what's the other one, Alexis? <laughs> Alexis, bring up my armament page. I don't think we're going to get there yet, although we may. Uh, but that, that worries me a bit uh, as we go. And I, when I tell these young people, they all say, well, you old guy, you know, you fly the, your, your 086 and it's got all the steam gauges. So, of course, you're outside. You gauges are probably wrong anyways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, to me, you know, if it gets quiet, I know I got a problem, yeah. you know. But I think that's something that we're going to have to work through. Uh, I'm all for transformational uh, uh, modernization of our aircraft. I think what we've picked to be the FBL is going to be great. I can't wait for fire to come on board. And the mods we're making to uh, the Chinooks, uh, as well as Gray Eagles and, and how we're doing that in the battle command systems. But we still got to fly the aircraft. And uh, especially at the altitudes we're going to. So I, I do worry about that change. When we were flying Cobras at night, and Mac, when you were flying uh, uh, 0858s at night and stuff like that, uh, you wouldn't look in the cockpit at all, you know? And if you did, you know, you'd say, okay, uh, check my stuff. I knew the guy was checking, yeah. but I was flying. Right. Or, okay, you got the controls, I got to do this. I mean, those are the type of crew coordination. Now we get guys sitting there trying to help each other, front seat, back seat, or left seat, right seat, pushing buttons and the, what do you call them, fabs and fobs and stuff. Yes. Hey, guys, when you get down below 100 feet, get your head out. Sir, I, I completely agree. And I think we have to find that balance as modern aviators yeah. of how do we leverage technology and then how do we use those tactics, techniques, techniques and procedures that our Vietnam uh, ancestors, those in Desert Storm in the early uh, days of Iraq, Afghanistan did. I remember uh, I had the, the, the privilege of uh, being the first unit equipped with UH-60 mics and we took them to Afghanistan. And I'll tell you, uh, I don't think we could have done what we did for the ground force without that mic model. And sir, I know you were pivotal in that after the Comanche program. Uh, but don't bring, bring that up on the podcast. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of people that wish we had Comanche, you know, but uh, I'll tell you what, we wouldn't have all the helicopters. That's what that, that was my whole point, sir. So if you want, we'll edit that, that part out. But but back, but uh, we had a fly, you know, flying in the Camdash Valley in RC East. Uh, we would fly in a cop Keating, basically tactical IMC until you're about 200 feet from the LZ, which was just about the size that you can land a Blackhawk there. And without that technology, we wouldn't have been able to provide that support, that critical resupply uh, for those soldiers in Cop Keating. By so, the way, a lot of that technology uh, on the mic model was kicked off by the Kilo in the 160th. <laughs> You know, uh, so that innovation, yeah, that exactly, that talked iterative, about. yeah. Yep. So that's a great segue, sir. It's like, almost like we paid you to do it, and we talked a lot about the past uh, and the present, uh, and now now we touched on the future. So we'll ask the seventeenth aviation branch chief and and branch proponent, General McCurry, what's on the horizon for Army aviation over our next forty years? Well, you know, um, we've been really, really a hundred percent. Uh, always on top of getting it exactly wrong in the past. So uh, we're hoping to do better than that. Uh, I think there's a few things that are certain though. The, the, few, the, the certain thing is we're still gonna need, you know, highly trained, disciplined, fit aviation soldiers, and we're still gonna need leaders of combined arms maneuver. So that part of what we do here at Fort Novacell and in the aviation schoolhouse is, is going to continue. And when, in the demanding modes you have, uh, in some of the situations described by General Cody a minute ago, you can imagine you might want to be even more fit than, than you might be today. Uh, the, tax, the, 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 the taxes on your body are pretty high at the speeds we're going to be flying and in the flight environments uh, we intend to operate. Um, I think uh, 
the balance between not only manned and unmanned assets that we're continually examining right now, but human machine interface. And uh, to General Cody's point, you know, um, I worry right now as the branch chief about right now today, not even in the future, right now today, I worry about that young front seater in an Apache at NTC when it's dark in that environment with the amount of stimulus coming at him, uh, him or her in the cockpit and the, you know, the, the five radios going off in their ear, the digital comms, the weapons pages, the fire control radar, the RFI, how they do all that, how they're still helping the guy that's flying the aircraft if it's the backseater that's on the controls how they're doing that while all this is coming at them. So I'm thinking about, you know, how do we best, what tasks can we offload from that aviator to help them execute that mission better? So I think that's a big, those questions are big ones as we move forward. And then when do you, you know, if we have the ability to make first contact unmanned, you know, we should, but then how do you then maneuver and bring the right mix of manned, unmanned uh, assets to bear? And, and, you know, a very super, probably the wisest guy in Army aviation that ever talked to me one time when we were talking about, you know, manned, unmanned, manned, unmanned teaming, mum T, 10 years ago told me, you know, hey, Mac, the next level of manned, unmanned is, you know, the unmanned to manned to command post so that we're operating in the enemy's decision cycle. Uh, And so those things are gonna be really important. What I do think is um, we're, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning can do things. It's got some shortcomings currently and even projected out to 2040 or more on, you know, intuition, natural curiosity, ability to interpret common language. Those things are going to require skilled fighters, aviators, flying soldiers now and in the future. I completely agree, sir. And and I think, you know, all those things you mentioned, I mean, if that doesn't fire you up, I, I don't know what does. And and if you're if you're listening to this as a lieutenant or captain and, and you're thinking about sticking around or not, there's a lot of exciting things on the horizon for Army Aviation. OK, I know I told you you both that that was it. But if you would, I know you, you're, you're both amenable to, to change because you're aviators. I'd like to close out the podcast with kind of a lightning round of uh, rapid fire questions. So in one or two minutes, I got three questions. Are you guys OK with it? Sure. Shoot. All right. General Cody, since you were most enthusiastic, we'll start with you. What Army aviation leader most influenced you as a leader and why? Pretty simple. It was uh, about four or five warrant officers. And that's not to denigrate uh, my my troop commanders uh, or my battalion commanders. I mean, I had had very good ones. Uh, But it was really the uh, W4s, W3s that I had, especially in 29 CAV, uh, certainly uh, in the 229th attack and, and, and in No Mercy. Uh, first of the 101st. I learned so much from them. Uh, And then, you know, he wasn't an aviator. Uh, He was a uh, infantry division commander, but he taught me about command. My war officers taught me all the things I needed to know about how to uh, train a battalion, how to look at crew mixes, how to, uh, they didn't have to train me on flow charts, so being a maintenance officer, I kind of had that. But in the relationships back and forth. But on command, and again, remember when I came into the branch, you know, there was a void. Today, you got a whole bunch of aviation generals for the last 20 years, but we didn't have any back then. We, we had a few, but we didn't have a lot. And so, a shout out to Burton D. Patrick, the commander of the 101st Airborne Division. He taught me so much about command. And then an infantry command sergeant major, uh, Re- General Mike Garrett's dad, Sergeant Major Ed Garrett, yeah. sat me down. And for all you sergeant majors out there, uh, sat me down when I came out on the command list and 
I had two or three sessions with him where he told me about how to be a battalion commander and the responsibilities of the sergeant major, the first sergeant, the platoon sergeant. And that was some of the best leadership counseling I got from both General Patrick and Command Sergeant Major uh, Ed Garrett. And lo and behold, his son ended up being a four-star general. So maybe Ed was counseling Mike a little <laughs> bit. But on the aviation side, it was my warrant officers. Uh, and I'm proud to say about seven of them are retired W-5s and are in the Hall of Fame today. Ned Hubbard, Paul Price, uh, Randy Jones, uh, Carl Schmidt. Uh, these guys were tough on me. But boy, I learned a lot from them. Mac? You know, I always tell uh, the young lieutenants and captains, you, you learn something from every, every leader you encounter. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, but you learn something. So I'll leave the, I'll leave the bad out. But, uh, you know, the first one was, was uh, uh, Major General Retired Ken Quinlan, uh, Squadron Commander, first the 17th at, uh, at, at Fort Bragg. Um, and, uh, you know, then I, I think there's a, there's a guy that's still local here, uh, Colonel Ellis Golson. So um, Colonel Golson was meticulous at doing things right, you know, doing the right thing and doing things right. And he drilled that into me, um, you know, and uh, took me a long way. Um, and then there's um, Lieutenant General retired Kevin Mangum. You know, I wouldn't be sitting here today without him as a, as a Lieutenant Colonel coming out of squadron command uh, he, he assigned me to the Pentagon and he knew I only had a year. I was, he knew, already knew I was going to go, uh, to Fort Drum to command the cab. And, and, uh, you know, 10 years ago, he assigned me to the Pentagon to Dame OAV, uh, over the objection of a couple people. Um, and, and he said, you know, I'm putting him there cause I want him to learn, you know, he might have an opportunity someday to, to, to grow. Uh, and so I owe that to him. And then the last two, you know, um, uh, General J.D. Thurman, um, first time I met him, I was a major, I had lunch. He, he uh, used to go to pre-command, I was a squadron pre-command course, and, and you know, they used to team you up with a senior army leader, and, and I got to have lunch with General Thurman. And uh, I said, I might tell you, ever, ever since then, he's never passed up the opportunity to, you know, give me a fist in the chest when I needed it, and, and, uh, and, and you know, always there uh, when I needed him to, to bounce things off of. And then the guy sitting right next to me, you know, I definitely would not be the branch chief without General Cody. I mean, I can, I remember so many times over the years where, you know, he's like, well, you can do that if you want, but you know, you might want to think about this. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and sometimes we as an army listened and, and sometimes we didn't. Um, uh, but we learned all those lessons the same. So, sir, thank you for your mentorship over the years. Uh, truly wouldn't be sitting here today without you. Well, all those generals prior to me were super generals. Uh, so thank you for that, Mac. All right, gentlemen, this one's this is probably the toughest one of the podcast. What's your favorite aircraft in the Army Aviation Inventory, past or present? And you can't pick the Black Hawk because I know that would be both your responses. I'm going to answer it this way. I love flying the Cobra because it was so challenging. And as you know, I'm a loach guy and I love that. But if I'm going to combat, put me in an Apache every day. All right. My favorite aircraft is General Cody's OH-6. <laughs> <laughs> And it's 100% FMC right now. That's right. Yeah. He keeps me updated on the maintenance status of it. And if he's going to go cross country, we talk about risk. But, uh, you know. He signs I, the A and B digitally. <laughs> I think just for monitoring on social media that he's getting ready for an arms inspection because of how meticulous you are in your phase maintenance. So that's right. well done, sir. That's right. To me, it's all about the mission, though. Uh, for favorite aircraft, so I have to fall back on the Kiowa Warrior just because of the mission. And you know, I'll never forget General Odierno, God rest his soul. We were having a discussion when we were considering getting rid of the Kiowa Warrior, and uh, he said, Well, you know, the strength of the Kiowa Warrior was never the aircraft, it was the Kiowa pilot. That's fair. I'll stand by that. Here, Calf. Okay, last one. What advice would you give to Army aviation soldiers joining the branch, branch today, sir? General Cody? Whether you're a uh, maintainer, 
whether you're uh, in supply, whether you're in the 3 5 platoon, uh, in the AVIM on the uh, shops, whether you're a crew chief or a warrant officer, pilot, learn something new every day. Be curious. Uh, aviation is a very unforgiving thing uh, in operations if you're not curious and you don't stay ahead. And so I would just tell all, first off, you pick the right branch to be in. Uh, it'll challenge you every day. Uh, and everybody on the team is important. Uh, the beauty of what Fort Rucker did under McNair and uh, probably Don Parker and a couple others was the design of the formations. It is really the analogy of a football team. I mean, uh, yeah, we got quarterbacks, we got, uh, we got these fast wide receivers and running backs called our pilots and stuff, but we also got the linemen, the crew chiefs, the maintenance guys. And then every once in a while, you need to have somebody really good and they call the 3-5 platoon because don't forget everybody out here in the podcast, these wonderful aircraft we built you and fielded to you are two and a half hours away from being useless if you don't have a well-trained, well-disciplined 3-5 platoon. And uh, so I would just say for all of you joining aviation, learn every day. If you're a young pilot, study your Dash 10 all the time. Uh, if you're a young pilot, go out and do a PMD with your crew chief. Uh, so you let that crew chief know he or her is important. But more importantly, you find out what the heck they're looking at. A PMD is a little different than a pre-flight. Uh, if you're a uh, young maintainer, fight like hell to get on a phase team. So you get more reps and sets. Uh, and if you're a young warrant officer, uh, just starting out in this branch, be a sponge. Spend as much time as you can down in the hangar, even when you're not flying. So, That's great advice, sir. General Curry? Uh, I, I think, you know, his mentorship shows, because I, I was going to talk about team, but I'll say it this way. I'll say, it's not about you. Yeah. You're not, you don't have a white scarf waving in the wind, you know, air medals dangling in your face. You are a flying soldier, and it's about that soldier on the ground to maintain that focus for every mission. Uh, and then secondly, take care of soldiers and families. We haven't talked a lot about families here today, but, uh, you know, it's our families, and we have some great families in Army Aviation, and it's our families that keep us going. And, and if you're just coming in and you have a family or you get a family while you're in, make sure they're still with you at the end. Also great advice. Well, gentlemen, thank. Oh, wait a minute. I, ju I just got a text, sir, from uh, Andy, our, our East Ace PAO. Uh, he's telling me we just got word that uh, a major Hollywood production company is going to do a high-budget film on Army Aviation. They finally got to their senses and stopped thinking about naval aviation, and they're going to go to the real deal. So uh, before they go ahead, though, uh, <laughs> Coincidentally, both of you are major characters in that film. Uh, and they'd like to know if you have any recommendations for them when they're doing the casting process for who to play you. And, and sir, Andy has an awesome teammate. Uh, already talked to the production company, but unfortunately, Vin Diesel's not available, so you're gonna have to pick somebody else. I have to go with my second choice. So I'll say, uh, I'll say Jeremy Renner, oh. you know, Hawkeye, because, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't think anybody shoots better than me, so I, I, want, I want Hawkeye. Uh, but I, you know, my wife will say Daniel Craig because she thinks she says I think I'm James Bond. So, sir, too easy. Robert De Niro. Oh, fantastic! Oh, perfect. Sir. The Godfather, and you're the Godfather of aviation. So, well, there you go. Well, I don't know a better way to end a podcast. So special thanks to General Cody and General McCurry for joining us today, sharing their insights, experiences, and stories from their lifetime of service to both Army Aviation and the nation on our branch's 40th anniversary. I hope you enjoy, all enjoyed this as much as I did. Thank you for listening. This podcast is produced by the United States Army Aviation Center of Excellence. Army Aviation, fly Army above the best.